ask you to open your Bibles, please, to Luke chapter 15. In the time remaining, we're going to look at one of the most famous stories that Jesus ever told. It's called the story, the parable of the prodigal son. You've heard it before. I've been praying this week that whether you've heard this a dozen times or if this is the first time that you heard it, that God will renew a vision of what Jesus is trying to teach us about who God is as a father in heaven. You know, Jesus uses the title Father. He introduces that title in his first public address in the Sermon on the Mount. He, he shares the title Father 18 times in the first three chapters of Matthew, his Sermon on the Mount. In the Old Testament, the word Father was used to refer to God only 16 times. Jesus wanted to introduce a paradigm about who God is, introducing him as a loving and forgiving and approachable Father. And every time in the Sermon on the Mount, when Jesus would use the word Father, he would always connect it with a possessive pronoun, your Father in heaven and my Father in heaven, our Father in heaven, a Father who belongs to us. And in one of the most profound and piercing stories that Jesus ever told, he was, he was intending, his purpose was to help people see the kind of God that, that loves us and that forgives us and the kind of heavenly Father that he is. And he paints a beautiful, beautiful picture. I've been praying. It's just hard to describe uh, the, the majesty of, of what Jesus is trying to tell us about who God is and in relationship our value to him. So in Luke chapter 15, verse 11, here's the context. Jesus was being accused of being a friend of sinners. He was being accused. In fact, if you look in verses 1 and 2, the, the, the Pharisees, the religious leaders, were talking about how bad it was that Jesus was a friend of tax collectors and sinners. Remember, we talked about the un, unapproachables, the unlovables, the untouchables last week. Well, that's who Jesus befriended. And in that context, after being accused of this, he tells three stories in Luke chapter 15. He tells a story of a lost sheep. He tells a story of a lost coin. And he tells a story of a lost son. So let's talk about the lost son, first of all, beginning in verse 11. And he, Jesus said, there was a man who had two sons. And the younger of them said to his father, Father, give me the share of property that is coming to me. And he divided his property between them. Now, many days later, not many days later, the younger son gathered all he had and took a journey into a far country. And there he squandered his property in reckless living. And when he had spent everything, a severe famine arose in the country, and he began to be in need. So he went and hired himself out to one of the citizens of that country who sent him into his fields to feed pigs. And he was longing to be fed with the pods that the pigs ate, and no one gave him anything. This is the lost son, the prodigal son. The father in this story represents God. The lost son represents you and me, spiritually lost The older son, that's for another sermon at another time, the older son represents a calloused heart, the calloused heart of the unbelieving Jews who would not be thankful and would not celebrate the fact that those who were sinners were forgiven by God. And so in this lost son, we see a picture of willful and sinful rebellion. You've got to understand this. This is intentional, purposeful rebellion. This was a dishonor for this younger son to even ask for the inheritance. It shouldn't have been his until his father died. And yet he asked for it. And oddly enough, the father gives it to him. Another picture of God kind of letting a sinner go his own way, letting a sinner make his own choices, even to rebel. And this lost son goes out and he squanders in reckless living. Other translations will say wild living. The, the point here is that he, he lived in a moral lifestyle of some kind, and he experienced financial collapse. He ran out of money, but not only did he run out of money, a severe famine hit. That's kind of the way storms work in life, right? Sometimes storms and pain come our way because we make sinful choices, but then other things happen in life that just make life miserable. It's a picture of the progression of sin. How sin starts at one point in a choice to rebel, but then it takes us to this point where he would even be in a pigsty to the Jews. Jesus is telling the story to the Jews. This would be the worst place this guy could be in a pigsty, longing to eat the pods that the pigs ate. The ideal here is that his sin took him further than he wanted to go. It kept him longer than he wanted to stay, and it cost him more than he could afford. That's the way sin progresses in our lives. It's a picture of utter loneliness. Look in verse 16. 
It says no one gave him anything. Jesus said no one gave him anything. No one cared. Utter destitution. Utter loneliness. It's a picture of our sin and our lost condition. Each one of us have been that son. Each one of us has chosen to rebel against the Father in heaven. And yet, something happens with this prodigal, which leads to the next thing. In verse 17, we see his return home. This amazing return back home. Look in verse 17. But when he came to himself, other translations will say when he came to his senses. He said, how many of my father's hired servants have more than enough bread, but I perish here with hunger? I will arise and go to my father, and I will say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before you. I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. Treat me as one of your hired servants. And so he arose, and he came to his father. This beautiful, beautiful moment where at the end of this guy's pain, at the bottom of life, he came to a census. And isn't that what normally happens, folks? When life becomes so miserable, when the pain of our decisions becomes worse than the pleasure of our decisions, that's when we wake up. This was his wake-up call. Pain was trying to teach him something here. His circumstances were telling him that his ways, that his plan was not working. And God was trying to teach him to come back home through his circumstances. And so he has this awakening, but then he comes clean. Uh, Notice he admits his state. He, He doesn't minimize it. He, he, he doesn't kind of overlook it. He says, Father, I have sinned. Even to the point where he'd say, I'm not worthy to be called your son. This, this desperation at the end of the rope where he would finally admit his sinfulness. But he came to his senses, he came clean, but also he came home. He remembered his father. What a beautiful picture. In a, in a distant country, far away, living a life of dishonor, displeasing to his father, there was something in him that remembered his father. And he said to himself, maybe, just maybe, my dad will take me back. Which leads to the next thing. This picture of a loving father. And really, this is kind of the whole point of the parable, folks. Again, I wish I had the words to describe for you what this really, really means. Jesus is painting a beautiful picture. It's called the parable of the prodigal son, but it could be called the parable of the forgiving father because that's really the point here. Look in verses 20 through 24. And he arose and he came to his father, but while he, that's the son, was still a long way off, his father saw him and felt compassion. And listen to this. And he ran and embraced him and kissed him. And the son said to him, Father, I've sinned against heaven and before you. I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. But the father said to his servants, Bring quickly the best robe and put it on him and put a ring on his hand and shoes on his feet and bring the fattened calf and kill it. Let us eat. Let us celebrate for this son of mine, my son, was dead and is alive again. He was lost and now he is found. And they begin to celebrate. What a beautiful, beautiful picture. At the end of this story, Jesus tells us about the father. His reaction to the son's sin. The father's heart. And just as extreme as the son's rebellion was, Jesus shares the extreme response and reaction, the extreme love that the father has for the son. Get this picture. A concerned father waiting for his son, longing, looking for his son, who sees his son from a long distance away, who then gets up and he runs to meet his child. And Jesus talks about how he embraced his son and he kissed him and he threw a big party to celebrate his return home. The father who fully forgives the son. There was no lecture No, I told you so. Nothing about his past, just as he is, uncensored, unedited, just as dirty and rotten as he is, he takes him back. I was thinking about that, that image of the father running to the son, and I thought, you know what, that's really an image that we don't see a whole lot. Normally, it's the other way around. 
And I had this memory of my two boys, this was before my daughter was born, when they were young, that we dropped them off in Dallas to stay with the grandparents for a couple of weeks one summer. And then we were going to pick them up. We were meeting them in Centerville. Some of you know that, that route. That's like the big transfer place between Dallas and Houston. And so we were meeting them at a Dairy Queen in Centerville. And uh, we go into the restaurant. The boys are sitting there eating with their grandparents. And they see me, and they just jump up, and they run to me. I'll never forget this image of them running to me and just hugging me there in the Dairy Queen. And I point over to Mom, who's walking from the car, and they see her. And, Mom! And they go run to, to her and embrace her as well. That's normally the way it works. Children run to us. Some of you who go on a trip, you come back home. Maybe you're on a business trip. You come back home, your kids run and meet you at the door when they're younger. Not so much as teenagers, but when they're younger, (laughs) right? (laughs) You've seen these pictures in airports of a businessman returning from a trip, and you'll see a, a child running down the long corridor. I've seen it in person, a child running to embrace the father who is just returning. I guarantee you guys will not run to go get your children in Discovery Kingdom today, but when they see you, (laughs) they will run towards you. That's normally the way it works, but here, the exact opposite is occurring. The father is running to the son. Now, in the ancient Eastern culture, this was very undignified. A man of respect, certainly a man of wealth, would not run Number one, they wear those long robes, right? He'd have to hike up the robe and kind of run. It was a very disrespectful, kind of undignified thing to do, and yet Jesus is describing the Father as doing that very thing. Even in today's world, men don't run like that, not in, not in those robes. But the Bible says the Father ran to meet his son, and when he reaches him, he embraces him and he kisses him. Why? Jesus tells us, so when he saw him, he had compassion upon him. And it caused him to do something spontaneous, something very undignified for a man to do, to get up and to run to his child. Now, this is a little bit of a theme that's going on. Propriety is kind of thrown out the window when repentance is taking place. Isn't that true? We saw it with the woman who fell at Jesus' feet. Remember that awkwardly social moment? where she bursts into the house, she falls at Jesus' feet, she's weeping and she wets his feet with her tears and begins to dry his feet with her hair because she's overcome with repentance and yet it was undignified, yet in in Jesus' eyes it was what was needed and what was necessary and what was proper. This man run. If you're a dad, you kind of have that in your heart for your kids. There's this instinctive thing as a, as a loving father, earthly father, you, you, you want to meet your kids' needs. You want to love them and show compassion to them and, and, and forgive them, even if it's undignified. Years ago, my oldest son, Ryan, was playing t-ball when he was, I don't know, five or six years old. And we were late getting there, and so we drove through McDonald's and got a Happy Meal for him and uh, got to the baseball field, and he was out near the pitcher's mound and was warming up, right, throwing the ball around. He began to look pale. And I could tell something was not quite right. And and Ryan just all of a sudden just threw up right there on the pitcher's mound. (laughs) Yeah, it was a nice moment. And uh, uh, I just instinctively ran out to the field, knelt beside him, helping him finish throwing up. (laughs) If you guys have been there, you know what I'm talking about. And then just covered the vomit with the dirt on the, <laughs> on the pitcher's mound. Just covered it up, you know. And we just walked off. I didn't care what people thought. I didn't care how awkward it was. My child was in need. That's what a dad would do. And so much so, this dad does that. This is the point of the parable, folks. And, it, and in that context, in the face of of religious leaders who were so prim and proper. In the face of religious leaders who said to Jesus, how could you eat with such people? In the face of religious leaders who could not lift a finger to show compassion to the ones that they labeled as sinners. This holy, 
righteous Father in heaven is not so big as not to stoop to show love. He's not so big as to become undignified. He's not afraid to take the first step to love us, to forgive us, to embrace us, and to be our Father. And this story says something deeply about our value to the Father in heaven. If you don't get anything else than that, it speaks so deeply that Jesus would say, God as a father will run to us even if it means public disgrace. disgrace. That's the kind of father that God is. Out of love in this beautiful, beautiful story, the prodigal son saying, child, instead of waiting for you, I'm going to run to you. Instead of judging you, I'm going to forgive you. Instead of lecturing you, I'm going to hug you. Instead of focusing on your past, I'm going to throw a party that celebrates your future from this point on. And that's who God is. And what a powerful, powerful image it is. Let me tell you a story. It's a true story that took place a few decades ago. A story that took place in, a, in Salinas, California. It's a city not far from San Francisco. There was a wealthy landowner, a rancher in that area, very, very wealthy. And he had two sons, much like this story, he had two sons. And when the kids were younger, he promised their inheritance, that he would give them their inheritance when they turned 18, the time that he believed that they would become men, the time that he believed they would be old enough and mature enough to be able to handle that kind of wealth. Well, the older son is very obedient, very compliant, no problems there. But the younger son, as he's growing up, the father notices he's got a rebelliousness in him. He's got a reckless streak in him and an unwillingness in him. And he begins to regret later in the teenage years that he made this promise to give him this inheritance. But he turns 18, and the son wants his money. And because he promised, the man gives the son the money. And not long after that, the son moves away to New York City. He goes to New York, and he buys a penthouse, very expensive penthouse. He gets a roommate, and uh, he begins to spend money, as you can imagine, like crazy. He surrounds himself with gorgeous women, lots of friends, He withheld no pleasure from himself. This goes on for years. Eventually, he becomes an alcoholic, years and years of this. Finally, he runs out of money. He's cheated out of some of his money. And then he runs out of money. He gets to the point where he's so alcoholic that his roommate kicks him out of the apartment that they lived in in New York City. This young man ends up on the east side of New York, and now he's homeless. He has no friends because he has no money. And he begins begging for food and for money. He begins begging for money to feed his alcoholism, to put some food in his stomach. But it gets to the point, he develops sores and becomes very sick. He gets to the point where he realizes, in a moment of sobriety, he realizes, if I don't do something, I'm going to die. That's how bad it got. He determines that he's going to go back to Salinas, California. So he sticks out the cup and he gets enough money finally, to save up to buy a train ticket that will take him clear across the country from New York to California. He gets on the train, no alcohol, so he goes through tremors, really bad trip, finally gets all the way to California, gets off the station at Salinas, California. He goes into a coffee shop, and he's sitting there, and he's struck with fear. All of a sudden, he's really close to the ranch, and he's struck with this fear. My my father, I've, I've rebelled against him. I haven't spoken to him. There's no way that he's going to take me back. There's no way that my father will take me back. He said, what I'll do, I'll I'll write a letter. And so he determines that he's going to write a letter to his father and somehow get this letter to his father. Here's the letter that he wrote. Father, I realize what I've done. I've wasted not only your money, but also my life, which is most important to you. I can't even begin to tell you about the awful things I've done. I'm embarrassed, and I'm at the end of my rope. I know of nothing else to do but to ask you if I can come home. I know that there is no reason why you should accept me back, but I plead and beg you that if you would accept me back, even as your lowest farm worker, I would do anything for no pay, just the room and board. Father, I have just enough money to take the train that passes by our ranch. As you know, it goes past the apple orchard near the end of the property, and I'm going to go by on the train tomorrow at 1 p.m., If you would accept me back, I would ask that you simply drape an old sheet over one of the trees nearest the railroad. 
as I'm passing by and as I see the signal, I'll know that you've accepted me to come home. But if I don't see the sheet, I won't stop at the train station. I'll keep going. You see, I can't bear to see you face to face. I don't have the courage. I've done too much, and I have no idea what's going to happen the rest of my life. He writes that letter in the coffee shop. He folds it up, and he's wandering around town. He sees one of the workers at his father's ranch. He goes up to the worker, and the worker is shocked. He doesn't even recognize this guy. He's changed so much. He says to the worker, would you please get this to my father? Please take this letter to my father. The worker says, yes, I'll take it today. The next morning, he gets on the train that will go out to the ranch. He's on the train, and again, he's struck with fear. (laughs) He's just thinking, there's no way this is going to happen. And so there's a man sitting across from him, and he says to the man, sir, we're coming up. He begins to notice they're coming up close to the ranch. It's close to 1 p.m. where the train stops at the ranch. We're coming up to the ranch where I used to live. Sir, could you please, for the next minute or two, look out the window and tell me if you see an old sheet draped upon a tree near the railroad tracks? The guy says, okay. So with his head bowed, the man looks out the window, and he sees something. And he says, son, you need to look. And the guy says, I can't look. He says, no, you need to see this for yourself. Young man looks up, and he looks out the window. And as far as he can see, a sea of white sheets for five square miles, a sheet on every tree there at the ranch. This is the kind of love that God has for you and me. And and that's just an earthly father, the earthly father's love for his lost son who's coming home. But folks, listen. (laughs) This is the love that is burning and blazing in the heart of God for you and for me. It's a love that's so hard to comprehend, and yet that's true of God. This is what Jesus was trying to teach in this parable. A God, a Father in heaven, who would run to us, who accepts us not as we should be, but accepts us just as we are. And his message to those religious leaders His message to all those who are hearing him, tell that beautiful, beautiful story. His message to you and to me is to come home. Come back home to a father who will run to meet you. Let's bow our heads. And I don't know how you walked into this room today. I don't know if you walked into this room feeling guilty and filthy. Feeling shame when it comes to standing before a holy and righteous God. I don't know if you came into this room today feeling distant. Like you're in a distant country living far from the Father. Jesus' words to us today is for us to come back. And maybe the circumstances of life are telling you that your plan is not working. Your way is not working. That you're at the end of your rope. You think about returning to God, you think about returning to your Father in heaven, you you just can't imagine that he would accept you, but I'm here to say to you that he loves you. This was Jesus' point. He loves you and he longs for you. He takes you this morning just as you are. This may be a reality (laughs) 
that, that you've known, that you've experienced. You've, you've walked into this room not feeling distant from God, but feeling close to God. And so today, it's just a gentle reminder to you to walk in the awareness of the love that the Father has for you. To walk in the awareness, the reality that He is a good, good Father. So Father in heaven, thank you for the depth of the love that you have for us beyond words. We can't even hardly grasp what it means, Lord, but we thank you and praise you for it. And I pray that those who feel distant would wake up and come to realize the kind of God that you are and that they would come back to you in reckless repentance. They would fall at your feet. They would open themselves up to your love once again. And for all of us, Father, help us to live and walk this week in particular in the awareness that you're a good, good Father. And as we drift... As we go our way, you're always waiting, always faithful to forgive and love a heart that repents and comes back to you. We thank you for that kind of love, Father. We don't deserve it, but we thank you for it and praise you for it. In Jesus' name I pray, amen.